Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today in Dave's Garage, the beginning of something epic. The Tiki Fire Umbrella Project starts now. I'm sure among your first questions is, what is a Tiki Fire Umbrella? That's probably something that's easier to show you than to tell you, so let's take a little tour of my shop where we'll meet the Fire Umbrella and see its smaller cousin, the Atomic Desk Lamp. On our way to see the umbrella, we'll take a quick little look at my shop, where as you can see, I'm seriously into primary colors, RGB LEDs, firework effects, flames, lasers, beam splitters. Pretty much if it's got anything to do with RGB LED, yep, it's for me. So nice guy that I am, I put them in the window for my neighbors to share, and I push a button on my phone and they burst into flames automatically on Halloween night, as I thought was actually pretty clever. Now, I grant you they look realistic, but they don't look that realistic, do they? I mean, people aren't going to really get nervous and call or something, are they? And then these nice fellows showed up. They were not impressed. When it flared up a bit here, it kind of startles him and he waves it off. He wanders off to play a couple games of Robotron while his buddy checks the panel, sees there's no imminent danger, and then he just kind of wanders around to look at what kind of madness has he stumbled into now at 3 a.m. in the morning, a nightclub in the middle of the suburbs for no reason inside of a garage. How fascinating. What a world we live in. Anyway, back to Dave's quest for fire, where I got eight channels running in parallel on the ESP32. And then I got to thinking, what else has eight of anything? I don't want to build a giant spider in my shop. Aha, uh -huh, umbrella. My wife has an umbrella. I'll take it apart, and I'll add all these lights to it. And guess what? It turned out pretty awesome, and even the wife approved. And so Carl, chief of security, he didn't have room for a whole umbrella, so we built him the atomic desk lamp, because everybody's got room for just an atomic desk lamp. You got room. You know you do. Now, I'll tell you what you can do with an umbrella that you can't do with a 69 Camaro or an old Mustang, and that is fold it up when you're not working on it so that nobody's bugging you, because it's not taking up any space. It's just a tiny umbrella. It collapses. Probably fits in the umbrella holder. Everybody's got an umbrella holder. Now, I know you're looking at this thing thinking, look at the power, the sheer power. How many volts is this thing? And the answer is uh, five. Yep, five volts. Yeah, because I'm a chicken and I don't like uh, high voltage, so I just bought a big bold power supply that does it all for me, and I only touch the five volt side. And I never worry about the high voltage side. It's a problem for a hardware engineer somewhere in a lab, and I don't touch it. I only touch the nice safe stuff that can't hurt you when it goes wrong. But of course, the number one reason to build it is to be able to plug it in in front of your friends and their spouses on July 4th as soon as it gets dark. Oh, were fireworks not permitted in city limits? I was not aware. But then again, I play by my own rules usually. Then you fire off your tunes, the umbrella starts reacting, the soccer moms go wild, I see King of Suburbia in your future. Now how much would you pay? But wait, there's more. This is not a commercial venture for me. I'm just a software guy that discovered a branch of hardware that I fell in love with and that served as a forcing function to get me to learn a bunch of cool new knowledge where I had been weak before. And that's my goal for you. I want you to learn a ton of stuff while having fun and building some cool projects. Now I get that everyone doesn't have room or need for a patio umbrella. And as mentioned, even though they are nice and that they conveniently fold up for storage when you're not working on it, if you want something smaller, the project can also be built as a desktop atomic fire lamp. So the lamp is very much a small umbrella, but instead of eight spokes, so there's only four. You can only see three on any one side at once, of course, but you can see the fourth one wrapping around the back there. And they act exactly like short little spokes for the umbrella. They are probably only one quarter the length, and they can still do all the same effects. There is some tuning in the software to adjust for the size, but that's about it. I'm going to fast forward through some of the basic effects here, so don't be surprised if you see a jump ahead, but that'll give you a quick tour. The flame effect, rendered purple here, can be done in pretty much any color. This was my attempt at the tubes you saw on the side of old Wurlitzers where it would bubble up wax through uh, color chambers and so on. I have no idea how the real ones work, but they look kind of like this, so that's what I was aiming for. On the one hand, this is just a simple VU effect that picks up the ambient room noise and maps it to a color rainbow. But what you don't see here is the amount of tracking going on to be able to work in almost any room environment. This will track a whisper, you can stick it in a club, and it should work in either. Here's another variant of the wax bubble thing that I'll just fast forward through. Ba -doop, ba -doop, ba -doop. Which should take us to the meteor or comet effect. You can have a, any number of them trapped here. On the umbrella, we trap several on the spoke at once, but on the lamp, it only looks probably good to have the one. And so they all bounce back and forth. And they're, they're different colors, so that each spoke is not a simple mirror of the others. Each spoke is totally independent. 
That means your effects, of course, besides being different on each spoke, can jump or leap from one spoke to the other. Now, don't forget this lamp's got a lot going on. Besides, it's also drawing the visuals in parallel on all these channels at one time. It's also picking up the music from the room and reacting to that as it draws the visuals. So it's sampling CD quality audio. It's doing an FFT on that to run the spectrum analyzer and the beat detection. And it's also managing the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth connection. Oh, I almost forgot. It's live on the internet and it runs an internal web server so you can connect to it from anywhere in the world, should the need arise. All of these things and more are also true about the Umbrella project, of course. The lamp is just a scaled down version of it, so everything I've said here is also true about the Umbrella. And of course, I'll explain or give you code for all this. I don't expect you to make it entirely up on your own. It also has a pleasant lamp mode in case you want to read a book. That would be pretty retro. Whichever route you choose to go, or even if you decide to just sit back and watch, over the course of the next few videos, I'll take you step by step, piece by piece, through the entire process. Because I figure there are four types of people. Those that actually want to build one themselves, those who just want to know how it's done, those who like to watch, and those who just want to own the thing in the end. If you're in any one of those buckets, I think you're in for a fun ride. But if you're in more than one, all the better. Since we likely haven't met, allow me to introduce myself. My name is Dave, and I paint with light. Well, that's perhaps what I would say if I were a pretentious artist and not just a pretentious programmer who likes, no, who loves his dust blinking lights and the more the better. But other than being some dude who likes LEDs a lot, what credentials do I actually have to be teaching you electronics? None. None whatsoever. I'm not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy. These fancy plaques above me are reminders of my career at Microsoft and beyond, where I amassed quite a few patents in my day. But patents don't always prove much, really, so I tend to point to the projects that I worked on, like MS-DOS and Windows, and to the pieces that I specifically designed and or coded, like the Windows Task Manager, Zip Folders, and a couple of others were projects that I started in my den at home and then integrated into Windows. By and large, however, I had the great privilege of working with some really smart and talented people on large routines with much bigger goals. But few of them could solder worth a damn, and neither can I, because like most of them, I'm a software person through and through. So I try to avoid soldering and fancy fabrication, and yes, I guess that means I consider soldering to be fancy fabrication, wherever I can, because I'm entirely self-taught on the hardware side. And it also means I've probably got some bad habits that a hardware engineer will be entertained by, or enraged by. And for those who are entertained by neither software nor hardware, I do manage to fall off a ladder shortly after spinal surgery for some slapstick humor and painful drama. And speaking of spinal surgery, that's how this all got started. One day, I was working out here in my shop. I was upside down and kind of folded in half under the dashboard of my 1969 Pontiac, craning my neck around as far as possible with a little flashlight to try to find some particular color connector, when all of a sudden, pow, my C5, C6 disc exploded. It had been problematic for a while, but all of a sudden it was serious. And I might add, seriously painful, and a bad position to be upside down and alone in. Once I had an MRI, it turned out that if I didn't want surgery, I basically had to wait it out prone on the sofa for a couple months to see if I could somehow rehab without it. I couldn't support my head well enough to sit at my desk or in the shop, so I was stuck on the sofa, propped up with pillows in a semi-comfortable position, and in no small irony, given the only decent laptop we had on hand, a MacBook Pro running Mac OS. I was a stranger in a strange land. I was also determined not to waste time gorging on Netflix or movies. I wanted to learn something new, so I turned to YouTube to look for topics like AI. Somehow, instead, I stumbled across a number of channels on the Arduino microcontroller and various projects built upon it. Since I had one in a closet somewhere, I dug it out and started to tinker. Once I was well enough to move around a bit, I'd write the code on the sofa and then run the laptop out to the shop to flash the chip and check the results, usually not being what I wanted. Then back to the sofa to the rest of the neck and debug the code. And just repeat until you know what you're doing. It's a good way to strengthen both your neck and your coding skills. My own big aha moment came with my introduction to the type of LED known as a WS2812B. What I'm going to tell you may sound like overkill, but it's really very clever and they're super useful. Each LED has its own tiny little chip. And it has a serial port in the front and a serial port in the back. And you can chain hundreds of them together in a long row for as long as you can reach power and ground. You send your command, such as set the 514th LED to be bright blue, you send it to the first LED and it just passes it down along the chain for you. This means other than power and ground, you only have one wire. And that one wire is the serial connection to the first LED. And it's merely a connection to one of your Arduino pins, and that's all you need to control a thousand of them. 
There is massive support from the Arduino community and amazing color libraries exist to do beautiful animations with a minimum amount of knowledge and work. Our first example will be a color cycling LED on a tiny circuit board simply plugged into a micro USB cable. No soldering, no wires, no jumpers, no breadboard. All software more or less. Those will be our first baby steps and anybody should be able to follow along with them. And then from there, starting with an empty breadboard, we'll move to controlling a ring of LEDs to look like a very realistic little candle. And we'll just keep plugging away, improving it a little bit each time, until we have a roaring umbrella inferno on eight parallel channels with dual cores and Wi-Fi and Bluetooth and a phone app and music reactivity. And you'll realize that all of a sudden, holy cow, it turned out amazing and you know how it works end to end because you were here and you saw it and ideally you possibly even did it. And if you've been following along, hopefully yours works as well. And by the way, I don't expect you to run out and build this thing live with me the first time through. Odds are, if you do build one, you'll wind up watching at least parts of this more than once. And from what I understand of YouTube viewer metrics, repeat views are a beautiful thing. Perhaps you can even make a tradition out of it somehow, gathering the family each holiday season to learn the story of where and how Dad crafted the original family fire umbrella during the darkest days of the 2020s to bring light into the heart of the family once again. Back in reality land, the Tiki Fire Umbrella actually evolved naturally from other electronic art projects that I've been working on. The basic flame effect goes back to my very first RGB LED project, the strip that runs the length of my workbench. The strip supports a couple of dozen different effects, as does the umbrella, of course. Let's take a closer look. This is the flame effect you've seen behind me the whole time, but I'm going to step out of the frame so that it focuses on the back wall. And right away, it'll start rotating through some of the effects. These are actually some of the first effects that we'll be doing because they're actually some of the simplest things to do. Like this marquee, a scrolling rainbow palette, which might be a bit intense for everyday use. The effects are all managed by a little box on the wall that has an LCD display and a control dial to step through all the options. And now, I don't want to get your hopes up, but randomly, sometimes, a shooting star will appear. You never know when it can... Oh, wait, oh my goodness, what are the odds? We are truly blessed. Right during the demo and everything. He'll do his run across the sky and back, and the best part is this one is super simple code. It's literally light a couple pixels and then pixel fade the entire strip. Repeat. It's like four lines of code. And speaking of simple, this bouncing ball effect will uh, fire two balls, which will then split into three each for a total of six, and then each will follow a prescribed physics path. And it looks surprisingly realistic. Uh, what's amazing to me about it is how simple the code is as well. I'll put the code up on screen, not that you'll be able to see it very well, but it'll give you a, a sense of the size we're dealing with so that you don't think this is like pages and pages and pages of code. This is like a paragraph of code. My goal is to make it really simple for you to follow along, so I'll be giving you much of that code. One of the next things I did was still a horizontal strip, but this time it was for my truck that I had just spent five years restoring. A 1970 GMC Sierra Grande Custom Camper Longhorn. A long truck with a long name and with a factory 402 big block, buckets, air, gauges, and a lot more. These trucks just have two tiny little stoplights, decently big disc brakes, and no headrests, which means I really did not want to get hit from behind in one of these, let alone for the truck, but for my own sake, because the most common injury is to put your head into the back window if you do. So I was certainly trying to avoid that by being more visible, and here's what I came up with. One of the really nice things about the WS2812B LEDs is their ability to do pretty much any color. So here you can see the signal doing amber, and it'll do amber on the right hand side as well, obviously. And when we get to do braking, you'll see it flash red, and it'll use the exact same LEDs in the same position, but now issuing red color instead of yellow. I built this system because these trucks have absolutely no headrest and barely any factory brake lights, so they're pretty prone to being hit from behind, and I really wanted to avoid that at any cost. I'll show you how to build one of these, and it's surprisingly easy, especially if you have a 7-pin trailer connector. A little more challenging if you've just got a 5-pin. The LEDs make it much harder to fail to notice. And when it's time to back up that driveway or back that boat up, this provides about a thousand times the factory illumination of the tiny backup lights from the factory. And if you're a law enforcement officer with a pickup truck, you'll appreciate the emergency bar mode. Of course, these can only be enabled by people that are authorized to use it, but if you have it, I imagine it keeps you a fair bit safer on the shoulder of the road. In the next episodes, we'll actually start to build some of these projects together. I'll show you precisely how to start with a single color LED on a circuit board, and from there we'll keep making it cooler and more amazing every step of the way. And remember, the umbrella is just one step on that path. If you subscribe to the channel and follow along, we'll go all the way from zero to hero, winding up with full motion wireless video playback on a matrix of LEDs like a Jumbotron. All on the same chip we start with in the next episode, and it costs like six bucks. 
but you'll have to follow along to find out. I do hope to see you back here for that. And speaking of next time, to make sure there is a next time, unless you're my mom, you'll probably never see this channel again unless you subscribe. So please be sure to not only subscribe to the channel, but also to ring the bell icon. It turns out that ringing the bell is actually an important part of it, as that's what actually will notify you when the new episodes are available. So thanks for stopping by the shop tonight. I hope you found it some combination of entertaining and informative. At the time of this filming, I only have about 750 subscribers, so maybe this is your big chance to get in on the ground floor or something. I hope you'll consider subscribing, and I hope to see you next time. Good night. And since you've seen the shop, I might as well give you the tour of the backyard as well. Here's a shot of the guest house with the fireworks effect built in, the exact same code that we're going to be working on and starting on next episode. So, if this is the kind of thing that looks cool to you, you know what to do.